Find all back episodes and other information at mattsaudioblog.com. The Battle of Rook's Rest is a key battle, both emotionally and strategically during the Dance of Dragons, and it will be featured in season two of House of the Dragon, at least judging from the leaks and the teaser footage that we've already gotten. Today, we're gonna be looking at that battle and some of the key players. Where is Rook's Rest? Why is it important? And who are the stakeholders in this battle for it? Needless to say, we'll be spoiling some events in season two of House of the Dragon, So here's your final warning to leave this presentation before we start giving spoilers. And if you're sticking around, I'm Matt, and welcome to Before the Dragon Podcast. Thanks for joining us, and remember that you can always send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com, or you can send posts or comments to us at the letter B, the number four, the Dragon Pod on the site formerly known as Twitter, or using that same spelling to find our YouTube channel and leaving comments on our videos there. We'd love it if you'd like our videos and subscribe to the channel, or leave written reviews and stars for our audio podcasts wherever you get them. Let's get to Rook's Rest. Most House of the Dragon content providers have believed for quite a while that we will get this battle during season two of the HBO show House of the Dragon. How do we know? For one, there's been plenty of leaked footage showing what we believe to be parts of the aftermath of the battle, as well as shots of the battle itself from the teaser trailer released in late 2023. Corroborating that with events and the timeline described post Lucerus's falling to his death in George R. R. Martin's Fire and Blood provides more than enough circumstantial evidence to be able to make this determination. As a trivia note, at least in the Game of Thrones HBO franchise, this isn't even the first time we've heard the term Rook's Rest. In the season three finale of Game of Thrones, Davos tells Gendry to follow a star until he sees Rook's Rest, but not stop there to keep going. But what is Rook's Rest? Where is Rook's Rest? And why is it important? Who the hell or what is Rook? And why are they resting? Okay, strike that last question. The Maesters don't seem to care very much about that one. For now, anyway. Rook's Rest is located on the northern shore of Blackwater Bay, west of Crackclaw Point. Thanks to maps produced by Atlas of Ice and Fire blog's website, we can see that Rook Rest is northwest of Driftmark, almost due west of Dragonstone, northeast of Duskendale, and southeast of Maidenpool. As a physical description, Rook's Rest is surrounded by fields to the west, piney woods and mist-shrouded hills to the north, and surrounded mostly by the narrow sea to the east and the south. During the time of the dance, it was the seat of House Staunton. Lord Staunton, who actually doesn't seem to have a first name in the books, but has been given a first name of Simon in season one of House of the Dragon, was seen to be a member of the Black Council, supporting Queen Rhaenyra's claim in the season one finale. It is for this pledge to Rhaenyra that Rook's Rest becomes the target of the Greens and King Aegon II. It is one of the first major battles with incredible consequences that we will see. But a whole lot of things have to happen before Rook's Rest, which leads us to our first reckless speculation. Reckless speculation. Reckless speculation. And the winner of the first reckless speculation is... When in Season 2 will the Battle of Rook's Rest probably happen? Many are speculating that Rook's Rest episode will be a mid-season episode, likely either episode four or five. But let's think about this. If the chronology of Martin's Fire and Blood is to be strictly followed, many things should happen prior to that mid-season episode. There's Damon's taking of Hall, Blood and Cheese, the Battle of the Burning Mill, Otto's Ink Problem, and the Royal Guard Rumble, a.k.a. Eric and Eric. See what I did there, Patman23? These events will all 
probably precede Rook's rest, although we must also acknowledge that some of these events might not even make it into the television show, which would really be a shame. Still, let's review in about 77 seconds what happens leading up to Rook's rest without getting into too much detail, mainly because I might want to put some content out on each of these subjects in the near future. Rhaenyra continues to stare at Shipbreaker Bay while Damon goes to Heron Hall and takes it from likely Lord Larry Strong's groundskeeper. He then plots with the White Worm. Is she still even in the show? To get revenge for Luke's death. Enter Blood and Cheese, whose disgusting behavior absolutely traumatizes Helena for life. After that, the Brackens and the Blackwoods fight, because they always fight. And that's your Battle of the Burning Mill. Aegon is, of course, enraged by the Blood and Cheese thing, as well as the taking of Heron Hall and the Vale and the North declaring for his half sister. He's so tired of Otto's diplomacy attempts, he fires Otto, thrones everyone with swords, not quills. Spill blood, not ink. And he makes Kristen Cole the hand of the king. Kristen is so ready for the job. Shocking. And he proposes simply using stealth, Eric. Or is it Eric? So they send the twin, but the twins end up killing each other. While fighting, did they profess their love for each other? Or did they just call each other traitor? Who cares? But now Kristen Cole is on the move thanks to a list from Lord Larry's and he's gonna take down some traitors to the Greens in the Groundlands. And that is how we end up at Rook's Rest. After knowing what leads up to Rook's Rest, we should probably now think about this. What are the stakes and who are the stakeholders at the Battle of Rook's Rest? Of actual stakes, perhaps most important is the Crown Lands region itself. These are the lands that surround King's Landing, and Rook's Rest is one of many seats of power within the Crown Lands itself. Looking at it from Aegon's perspective, having most of the houses in the Crown Lands loyal to him is essential for protection of King's Landing from attack. Even though the Valarian fleet's naval superiority can easily control the gullet leading into Blackwater Bay, to have all the lands around Aegon's city controlled by Rhaenyra's forces would lead to an almost assured lethal seizure. Controlling the Crown Lands is essential to creating a buffer that makes the city itself less vulnerable. Except to the previously mentioned Blackwater Bay itself, but also remember that Stannis Baratheon will lead an attack nearly a century and a half later coming through the gullet to Blackwater Bay, and boy did that attack end up failing. Of course, there is much more than sea power to worry about during the time of the dance. When it comes to dragons, air superiority is of course another concern. Air superiority. But we'll get back to that in a few minutes. For Rhaenyra's side, we see that support from anything west of the Golden Tooth is highly unlikely given the Lannister influence, and thus creates a dire need not only to shore up support from the Crown Lands, but also to further shore up support from the Riverlands. In the season one finale, during one of the councils, we see evidence of why Daemon will go on to Harrenhal. It's basically to ensure Muppet Tully's support. Lord Grover must be assured that he will be supported because as Rhaenyra says, he is fickle and easily swayed. For Rhaenyra, the Crown Lands are needed not only to ensure the surrounding of the Greens, but also to be able to lend help to the Riverlands easily. Back to Aegon, the punishment of the traitors who have pledged to Rhaenyra is a priority. And for his new hand, Kristen Cole. And this is why Kristen marches north from King's Landing. A little ditty that I like to call Kristen's Crusade. He first goes to Rosby and Stokeworth to gather additional forces. Both houses had previously allied to Rhaenyra, but were then forced to ally with Aegon against penalty of death. From those holdfasts, Kristen's first objective is Dustendale, House Darkland being considered a traitor to Aegon. The place is easily sacked and taken. Will we see this happen in the show? Most likely, though, 
it may be somewhat abbreviated depending on how much time is given to Brooks' rest. Darkland is beheaded and Christian Cole's army begins to march towards Brooks' rest in order to complete the dual objectives of shoring up the crown lands and the elimination of traitors. So the stakes are now clear, but who are the main stakeholders in this battle? Let's put aside our actual contenders for the throne, Rhaenyra and Aegon, at least for a moment, and concentrate on who is actually at Rook's rest during the battle. There is, of course, the crusader himself, Kristen Cole. And believe me, this guy is a vile little d butt hurt woman-hating fiend who wishes he could because he's probably the only one who thinks he can do the job properly. Maybe that sounds a little too biased. One of the interesting things that we see about Kristen is that he is driven actually from a sense of morality to do some of the most immoral things that we've seen. And one thing that we actually do know as far as this battle is concerned is that he can be at times a decent strategist. More on that in a moment. There is, of course, Lord Staunton. We've already discussed him to some degree. A loyalist to Rhaenyra, we have to assume that he is going to go back to Rook's Rest from Dragonstone at some point during all of these goings-ons in early Season 2, as I mentioned before. The books say that he is forewarned of Kristen's approach. He defends Rook's Rest from being sacked as best he can and then sends ravens to Rhaenyra asking for help. Kristen lays siege on Rook's Rest and begins to burn the surrounding lands. The next part of the list of stakeholders all consists of dragon riders and their dragons. First there is Rhaenys, riding Maelies. Remember that Rhaenys likely could have prevented this whole matter, at least in the television show, by simply saying Dracarys. Dracarys! When facing down the green contingent in the dragon pit. Dracarys! She chose not to, and we may seem to have evidence of why from the Season 2 teaser released in late 2023. In that teaser, we hear her voice telling Rhaenyra that there is no war so hateful to the gods as a war between kin and a war so bloody as a war between dragons. For whatever reason she has for saying this, it doesn't stop her from showing up to Rook's Rest to assist Lord Staunton. Let's pause on this for a moment. Why'd show up, given that she has this stance that we hear in the teaser, and given her choice not to eliminate the greens in their entirety in one single dragon breath at the pit. Dracarys! Rainy showing up in the books is not exactly clear. What is made clear is that Rainy shows up nine days after Lord Staunton dispatches his plea for help, and that she showed up alone. This begs yet another set of questions. Did the Black's War Council believe that one dragon would be enough? Does it take a total of nine days for ravens to reach Dragonstone from Rook's Rest, given that Davos tells Gendry to row there from Dragonstone in a single day and night? And if you think about it, Davos told Gendry to keep rowing after he reached Rook's Rest, but it took him six years to get the rest of the way? Okay, well, maybe that last question wasn't so relevant. I, I really kind of just threw that in there for Samantha739. She's been wondering where Gendry was, like, for four seasons until he finally showed back up again. Never mind. Perhaps a television show will fill in some of these gaps. Interestingly, there is an account of the entire dance done for the Season 5 DVD extras, and in that presentation... We are told that it was Rhaenyra who sent Rhaenys, but because that was created at the time or before the time of the release of Fire and Blood by Martin, it might be good to further surmise that we could seemingly have another occurrence of what I like to call the mushroom problem. Fire and Blood is a fictional history book, more or less, completely fictional, 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 fictional. that sometimes offers differing accounts and differing accounters. It's all compiled by yet another analyzing maester. 
In season one, book readers knew that there were conflicting accounts in regards to what happened between Rhaenyra and Damon, or Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole. The television show, of course, has demonstrated that they chose to tell an outside and hopefully objective source where these kind of events have different accountings. And a similar problem will be faced in regards as to why did Rainey show up or was she sent? Did she choose herself? Who made the decision to send anyone? To give you some context, there are three basic tellers of the story in Fire and Blood. Septon Eustace, who we've seen in the show, squarely in the green camp. There's Mushroom, 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 who tells an accounting from inside the camp of Rhaenyra. And then there is Munkin, who we might see taken over for Maester Orwell as the show progresses. Each give differing accounts on what was happening in Rhaenyra's camp around the time that the ravens from Lord Staunton would have arrived. Munkin tells the story of Rhaenyra's horror of Kingslaying and cites the story of Magar the Cruel as an example. Eustace says that Rhaenyra had a, quote, mother's heart and did not want to risk losing her other sons. Finally, Mushroom states that Rhaenyra was still so grief-stricken from the death of her son Luke that she actually recused herself from the war council, leaving Corlys and Rhaenys in charge. Since Daemon was off in the Riverlands making revenge, like with the Kristen and Daemon and Rhaenyra story, some elements of all may be combined to tell us what actually, or at least close to what actually happened. Perhaps Rhaenys decided on her own. Maybe Corlys even protested her going. Perhaps not. I suppose that no matter how, you can definitely say that Rhaenys becomes a major stakeholder in the battle at Rook's Rest. And now it's time to follow up on a couple of things I teased as I introduce the rest of the major stakeholders here. Remember that I said Kristen Cole shows a good deal of strategy on this campaign. When Rhaenys comes to Staunton's aid, Kristen Cole is ready with scorpions. You know, like those devices that we saw used against Daenerys in Game of Thrones. Kristen also uses archers and tries to actually take down the rider, Rhaenys. But he has one more trick up his sleeve. Something else that I teased earlier. Air superiority. Air superiority! Air superiority! That's right. The key to any modern warfare is, in fact, air superiority. And by Kristen's count, two dragons are better than one. And in regards to who will establish that air superiority, we enter in two other stakeholders. First, King Aegon II himself. He sits atop Sunfire. 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 Sunfire is a dragon that we've seen very little of in the show, but we can guess that we'll get a better look at this dragon this season, at least in this battle. And adding to the list of dragons for the greens, Aemon One-Eye Kinslayer. That no account... It's a shot that we've likely already seen in the 2023 teaser. When Rainey shows up, Kristen's first defense seemingly has very minimal effect on Rainey's or her dragon, the Red Queen Melee's. But then as Aegon and Aemon enter the fighting arena, the tide of the battle turns. The entirety of the setup and the Battle of Rook's Rest is relayed in a few scant pages of Martin's Fire and Blood. Gaps will have to be filled in, and likely will. It will also likely be the most intense dragon fighting that we've seen to date. This will not have the surprise element of Shipbreaker Bay with Vagar and Eryx, Aemond and Luke, and even when you look back at the Game of Thrones series, this will be much more intense than Jon and Danny fighting the Night King. There is no real indication of the total time of the dragon fight, but there is a few descriptive lines from Fire and Blood that has the potential to be expanded into amazing television, no matter how much TV time the dragon fight actually gets. Think of lines like this. Princess Rhaenys made no attempt to flee. With a glad cry and a crack of the whip, she turned Maelys towards the foe. Or how about, the dragons met violently a thousand feet above the field of battle 
as balls of fire burst and blossomed so bright that men swore later that the sky was full of suns. Or how about all three beasts went spinning towards the ground. They struck the ground so hard that stones fell from the battlements of Rook's Rest half a league away. All of these phrases can be filled in, drawn out, and in some cases possibly even ignored, even though some book readers might complain. We book readers do tend to complain at times, sometimes rightfully, sometimes not so much. My feeling on the matter is this. If we like what Condal has done in season one with the previously mentioned mushroom problem, then we are likely to appreciate his threading of that needle again leading up to the battle. And if we trust that, we can certainly respect what he shall do with the battle itself. There's a lot that has been speculated on by A Song of Ice and Fire fans for years now, ever since the publishing of The Princess and the Queen, and especially since the publishing of Fire and Blood. We have a few scant phrases that actually allow us to understand big key points, but there are many points in between, and there's probably even points that set up the idea of Rainey's even taking on two dragons when she is on a singular dragon. I won't get into too many of those speculations, but you can look all over Reddit and find them. One thing that we do know is that George R. R. Martin has gone on record as saying that dragons continue to grow as they get older. They never stop growing. So a dragon like Vagar would be huge, 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 given her age as compared to the other two dragons. Sunfire, being the youngest of the dragons, would probably be the smallest, but also age and size might equate to speed. Now, Melis was considered one of the fastest dragons. However, its sheer mass against Vagar would not have been able to escape Vagar coming down on top of them and them all falling to the ground. On the other hand, it does seem that Melis being one of the fastest dragons, plus having the experience of Rainey's riding her, as opposed to a less experienced Aegon, did allow Melis to overtake Sunfire and was actually going to clasp her jaws around Sunfire's neck. All of these things are very questionable as to how they will come into play as we see this battle unfold on a television screen, but we'll likely get something very exciting and perhaps some of us will get some answers to questions that we've been having for a number of years. And that brings us to the results and the aftermath of this battle. Melis the Red Queen is dead. Rhaenys the Queen who never was is believed to be dead, her body blackened by fire near Melis. And Aegon survives but is so severely burned that his life is forever changed. And his dragon Sunfire has a wing torn off. Only Aemon and Vagar seem to emerge relatively unscathed. Kelsey Matson of Collider vocalized a fierce ultimatum to the House of the Dragon showrunners that they had better not change any of the results of Rook's Rest. They did so in an article published in September of 2023, and I'll put that link in the show notes. I would imagine that in writing that article, one of Matson's concerns might be a worry that Condol might try what our friends over at the Joffrey of Podcast might call a double L. Double L? A Lanar Lives kind of approach to Rainey's. And to that note, there is one thing that I find interesting. First, I will say, of course, that it is very, very likely that Rhaenys did not survive Rook Rest. Yet, in Fire and Blood, it is said that a body believed to be Rhaenys Targaryen was later found beside the carcass of her dragon, but it was so blackened that no one could be sure it was her. Now, believe me, there isn't any huge support for any theory that Rhaenys somehow survived the Battle of Rook's Rest. But if Condal wanted to pull another Lanor situation, he has that one little snippet of canon to run with it. Again, let me be clear and say that I don't think that will happen. I'm just saying that there's that one little casting of doubt that could allow book readers and non-book readers alike to speculate and debate on and have lots of fun with. Anyway, we'll see how the show ends up treating it. And I'll say to Kelsey Matson. I wish 
heavily for your maintained sanity regarding this matter, no matter how it turns out. There are, of course, other huge ramifications on top of losing the queen who never was as a result of this battle. One thing that there is no seeable avoidance of for sure after Rook's Rest happens, and that is likely the head of Lord Staunton falling to the greens. No, literally fall, you know, like off the shoulders. <laughs> Sunfire's lack of ability to fly reduces the power of the dragons at the disposals to the greens as well. Aegon himself is so messed up physically that Aemon must assume the role of protector of the realm in his stead, at least for a while. For the Blacks, the loss of Rhaenys creates a tension between Corlys and Rhaenyra that may have already been there but is kindled up even more. And you also have to consider that the Blacks, who already have more dragons than dragon riders, explored at the end of Season 1, must now figure out how to get more dragons in the air. Why? Because they've learned that air superiority is important. Air superiority. Another factor that must be considered is how the small folk will perceive what has happened and its ramifications. In Fire and Blood, we read, but it was the head of the dragon Meles drawn through the city on a cart that awed the crowds of small folk into silence. Septon Eustace tells us that thousands left King's Landing afterwards until the Dowager Queen Alicent ordered the city gates closed and barred. We can use some of this book information to further speculate on some things that we might have seen in the late 2023 teaser trailer. Could the shot of Bela riding Moondancer and screaming be in response to her grandmother Rainey's loss at Rook's Rest? Could the shots of Alicent amongst fearful and perhaps even rioting small folk be a result of a mass exodus attempt due to the sight of the head of the dragon Meles? Or might that whole shot be about something entirely different? Whatever the answers to those questions may be, we'll be finding out in the summer of 2024 as House of the Dragons returns. What I would really like to do now is hear from you. What did you think of my presentation? What do you think will happen at Rook's Rest? And do you feel like the books will be followed very closely in regards to this matter? If you're a non-book reader and you're here, well, my first question would probably be, why did you want to get spoiled? But my second question is, really, that's your business. But what do you think of what's going to happen in regards to this battle? Are you excited for it? Remember that I always welcome your feedback at the letter B, the number four, the Dragon Pod, on both YouTube and the site formerly known as Twitter, or you can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. This has been Matt. Thanks so much for joining me here on Before the Dragon Podcast, and hope to hear from you soon. Find all back episodes and other information at mattsaudioblog.com.